Ted, I want to ask you about something that I think a lot of folks would find very interesting outside of political circles, and that is taxing alcohol and what it does to lessen the amount of drinking going on out there. If you would, in general terms, sort of lay out the framework of what that is and what you uh, discovered in your research as well. Well, historically, I think the public and lawmakers have often tended to think of alcohol taxes as a revenue raiser. Mm -hmm. We, in, in our state and in many other states, we impose a very small excise tax on alcohol. And when you break it down to, to the amount per standard drink, we're talking about a few pennies. Um, but those pennies add up because we drink a lot and this, it, it raises about $50 million a year for the state. But what many people have overlooked is the fact that the taxes really are also a tool of public policy because they affect the price of the alcohol that's sold. And um, it's pretty clear that when the state imposes a tax on these items, the distributors or wholesalers pass that tax on to consumers. And so it artificially makes the substance a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. And this is important because the basic economic principles of supply and demand say that when you raise taxes a little bit, you reduce demand some. And in this case, you particularly rate, uh, reduce demand by young people who don't have necessarily as much access to cash and people that are really exposed to the price increases because they're consuming a lot of alcohol. And so uh, the research has gone on over many years and in many states. And on my read of it all, it seemed pretty definitive that when you raise alcohol taxes, there's a reduction in, in consumption and that you see a lot of reductions in the harms that alcohol can have. You see reductions in DWI, you see reductions in, in cirrhosis, some of the chronic conditions associated with alcohol. Um, so, you know, we know that this policy measure is effective. We see, uh, lawmakers really neglecting it, though. Over the last 30 years, not only have we left alcohol taxes at their same rate, we've allowed inflation to eat away at them because yeah. we, we tax alcohol. This is kind of subtle, but we tax alcohol by the volume that is sold, not by its price. Mm -hmm. So that means a $6 pack of Budweiser 20 years ago has the same tax on it as a $12 pack of Budweiser has today. So uh, all told, you know, we're kind of turning our back on one of the most important measures to addressing excessive alcohol use. Um, and that's not only true in New Mexico, that's true across the country. Mm -hmm. Representative, Absolutely. please, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, that's all true, and uh, especially to prevent underage drinking, um, because if the younger you are when you start to drink, the more likely you are to become uh, an, a lifelong abuser of alcohol and see those effects. In 2017, um, we had a group that was trying to um, address that and raise the tax, I think it was a quarter a drink. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to kind of change that a little bit and come back to trying to make it a percentage so that we don't have to um, have inflation or different things change the effectiveness of raising uh, the tax mm -hmm. and the deterrent effect that it has. Dr. Way, I've got a question for you. Part three of the series is entitled Poisonous Myths, Stereotypes About Alcohol and Native People. Uh, this I think it was probably one of the more fascinating parts of the whole seven-part series in that these perceptions about Native people are actually quite wrong. Uh, that we, that we, even amongst Native folks themselves, you work in Gallup. I'm, I'm curious what, that's, what you know, your sense of that and how we get past a lot of that uh, perception problem. We certainly see that alcohol affects our population to a high degree. You know, mm -hmm. we certainly see that the percentage of uh, those that suffer that have alcohol related deaths are higher in our populations here. Mm -hmm. I think there are perhaps some of the misperception are some of the causes for that. You know, it's as I mentioned before, they really are multifactorial. Um, there's a lot of things that are, you know, if you look at um, the social vulnerability index, which is the something that the CDC puts out that has 15 factors that determine the social vulnerability of a certain community. Um, McKinley County, not surprisingly, has the highest rates of social vulnerability. You know, essentially right. any uh, thing that puts them at risk for not being able to handle certain things, say like COVID, for example which is why we really suffered uh, some challenges with COVID in our, in our area here of the state. So for example, people who live multi-generationally, people who live uh, in higher levels of poverty, um, 
uh, lower levels of education, all of these things contribute. Um, in addition to some of the historical trauma that is not even incorporated into these 15 social uh, vulnerability risk factors, um, historical trauma of uh, our Native American communities mm -hmm. and those suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD. So I think it's so important uh, that we continue to address all of these factors and not just focus on one or two that we may think um, are the main reasons why people struggle with alcohol use disorders. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Mr. Alcorn did a great job in highlighting this and saying that even if you took away all Native Americans um, as part of the statistics, the state would still have the highest rates of alcohol related deaths, yep. um, even among other populations, other other groups. So I think it's important that it's not a Native American, not a Native American population, uh, problem. It's a problem across the state. Yeah. Dr. Can Venner, please do in? pick up on that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, just two more things. I love that, um, you know, how complex it is. There's um, the other large misconception is that Native Americans have some sort of biological predisposition to an alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder, um, and there's no scientific evidence of that. The, our metabolism rates are the same, our genetics are the same, we have the same vulnerabilities. We do end up with higher rates of alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder more broadly, um, but it's due to these other factors, which we might call social determinants of health, like high poverty, um, low formal education, unsafe neighborhoods, you know, and not access, food deserts, things mm -hmm. like that, um, systemic racism, discrimination, all of those kinds of things. So there's a balance of higher rates of substance use disorders and higher rates of abstinence from alcohol. So we have some of the highest rates of not drinking any alcohol um, compared to all other races, especially mm -hmm. in the past month. That would be news to most people, I think. That's, that's interesting to have that out there. Dr. Wei, I'm, I'm curious, there's a, I'm forgetting the name of the drug that uh, combats cravings. I'm curious why, or, or maybe a better way to say that or ask this, is there some momentum to have this drug use a little more widespread, available via your doctor? Because in the case of Steve here in part five, it was almost miraculous what he's had. What should we know, what's the name, name of that drug, first of all, and what should we know about it? Thank you for asking. Um, mm. The medication is called naltrexone, mm. and it's a medication that's available. It helps to block the opioid receptor, which is one of the things that can get triggered with people who um, particularly have positive responses to alcohol. Um, when they drink alcohol, they might get the positive response that that made them feel good. Um, mm -hmm. Part of it through the opioid receptor, among many other receptors in the brain, that mm -hmm. then say, ooh, that was good. I want to get more of that and more of that and more of that. Um, and so this medication actually helps to block that medicate block that feeling. And the great thing is it doesn't make people sick. I think one of the medi medications kind of get a bad rap sometimes because um, the first medication that was around and the only medication that was around for a while is something called disulfiram or antabuse. And it was such that when you drank, when you um, took the medication and, you, and then you drank alcohol, it actually made you, made you feel horrible. Oh. So what do people do? They tend to just not take the medicine anymore. The nice thing about naltrexone is that it does not have any of those effects. And in fact, some people say that when they're drinking while they're taking the medication, it actually helps to stop that positive cycle of, huh, when I drink, I don't really get these, I don't really get those positive responses. I don't feel bad, mm -hmm. but I don't get such um, euphoric effects to want to drink more and more. And so it kind of stops that cycle of addiction. It's because I think people put alcohol use disorders into a separate category of disease, unlike ALS, where there's like he's like he said that the you know like a lot of advertising on how to you know in, increase treatment. There's a little bit of th there are a lot of other um, factors and um, stigma that play around with alcohol use disorders, such that people don't necessarily want to advertise it and try to improve and try to improve treatment. And so I think that's one of the reasons why doctors also may not necessarily think about prescribing a medication. Um, there's a whole sense that it's a moral failing rather than actually a medical uh, disease that should be treated just like any other medical disease. Mm. Even if people relapse, we do lots mm. of things that we try to, you know, treat to prevent relapse as well. So just and putting that in the realm is super important. Interesting. And I was just going to interject, you know, I think what Dr. Wei has just put her finger on is one of the most important challenges for our state and any state to address this problem, which is stigma, um, mm. shame, uh, because it affects not only, of course, how people access treatment, how doctors think about it, but it affects how lawmakers think about this. When we're talking about um, the disparities that we see in our state and the preconceptions people have, 
uh, for example, about a predisposition towards alcoholism among Native people. You know, that's not only untrue, but it, it allows us in a kind of pejorative way to put the responsibility on someone else. And if you really step back and think that an alcohol disorder is an illness like asthma, like high blood pressure, like diabetes, um, and you sort of set that realm of objectivity around it, then you realize, oh, of course, we as a society would want to do everything we can to make access to the appropriate treatments easier for everyone, but also to make a safer environment where we have less of that disease emerging in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look around and you see New Mexico has much higher rates of alcohol disorder and, and, and the consequences of it than other places, it forces us to recognize that we, we don't have a safe environment when it comes to alcohol right now. Um, it's much more unsafe than any other state. And so we really have a collective responsibility to take the steps to, to make it better for everybody.